Happy Easter, everyone, and welcome to our Sunday worship for the fifth Sunday of Easter. Today is May the 10th. Um, before anything else, let me just wish everyone a happy Mother's Day. Happy Mother's Day to all of our mothers. A couple of announcements. Um, first, Children's Chapel is available for each Sunday. This morning, uh, Owen Conway is leading our Children's Chapel, and you can access that through the weekly annunciation. Um, there's a link there, and you can also get it at our website. We have a COVID-19 resource page on our website where you can access all um, worship and other offerings at this time. Next Sunday, May 17th, we have a very exciting Sunday. We're celebrating the lives and the ministries of some amazing people in our parish. We will be um, celebrating the lives of our confirmants, this year's confirmation class, an amazing group of young people who um, we hope will be confirmed by the bishop uh, this coming fall. Um, but we want to lift them up on this day and thank God for them. Also, thank God for our amazing graduating seniors. I believe there are 19 of them. They're remarkable people, um, and we thank God for each one of them. Also, um, fifth graders who are becoming rising sixth graders, we thank God for them this important time in their lives as they are rising sixth graders and will be welcomed into the youth group next year. And there'll be some, um, some special parts of our service celebrating all those amazing people. Also, just want to remind you that we have a wonderful video available through our website. It's another offering by Vic Malloy called Good Grief. Um, Vic is one of those wise, wise people. Um, and he offers an amazing presentation that's particularly appropriate for our lives um, with everything that's going on in our world. Finally, in this coming week, there will be some special communications coming to you um, from the church. Uh, I'll be providing something and we will be sending out a survey and to, all the per to all of us. And I hope you'll take just a minute or two, it doesn't take long, to complete the survey and then uh, submit it. Um, it will be an important resource for us as we go forward and look to the day where we will be able to regather with um, restrictions for in-person worship. Please, God. Um, I pray God's blessings and goodness for you and for your family through our worship this morning and in this coming week. God bless you. God love you. Happy Easter, everyone.
Alleluia! Christ is risen. The Lord is risen indeed. Alleluia! Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you, and also with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, whom truly to know is everlasting life, grant us so perfectly to know your Son, Jesus Christ, to be the way, the truth, and the life, that we may steadfastly follow his steps in the way that leads to eternal life. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. A reading from the first letter of Peter. Like newborn infants, long for the pure spiritual milk, so that by it you may grow into salvation. If indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good, come to him a living stone, though rejected by mortals, yet chosen and precious in God's sight. And like living stones, let yourselves be built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For it stands in scripture, see, I am laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone chosen and precious, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. To you then who believe he is precious, but for those who do not believe, the stone that the builders rejected has become the very head of the corner and a stone that makes them stumble and a rock that makes them fall. They stumble because they disobey the word as they were destined to do. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's own people, in order that you may proclaim the mighty acts of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. from the 
hand of my enemies and from those who persecute me. Make your face to shine upon your servant and in your loving kindness save me. Into your hands, O oh Lord, I command my spirit. reading from the gospel according to John. Jesus said, Do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house there are many dwelling places. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, so that where I am, there you may be also. And you know the way to the places where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you know me, you will know my Father also. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Philip said to him, Lord, Show us the Father, and we will be satisfied. Jesus said to him, Have I been with you all this time, Philip, and you still do not know me? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, Show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own. But the Father who dwells in me does his works. Believe me that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me. But if you do not, then believe me because of the works themselves. Very truly I tell you, the one who believes in me will also go do works that I do, and, in fact, will do greater works than these, because I am going to the Father. I will do whatever you ask in my name, so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If in my name you ask me for anything, I will do it. The Word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. speak to you in the name of the Good Shepherd, who leads us into life. Of the many things in this life I adore, one of the simple things I love the most are magazines. My kids don't quite understand this love for magazines. They don't know a time when publications like U.S. News and World Reports and Newsweek were how we actually learned what was going on in the world or that you couldn't just hop on Pinterest to find a recipe, that you had to go find that Better Homes and Gardens with the perfect pasta salad recipe in it. Or to get gossip, you turn to the pages of Vanity Fair or People. This is just a completely foreign concept to them. My favorite magazine by far, even especially as a young teen, was Southern Living. And yes, it is a perfectly embarrassing admission to make that as a young teenager, I loved Southern Living, but I did. It was my favorite. While other girls my age loved Seventeen and Tiger Beat, I was just far more interested in what Southern Living had to offer me. Specifically, I was enthralled with the design features. I just knew I was going to be an architect or a designer, and this was all good stuff for me to know. In the decade of the 1980s, I learned many important things. While my peers learned the correct way to apply copious amounts of blue and green eyeshadow and maintain the height of their bangs, I learned that it was indeed possible to coat an entire room from floor to ceiling with chintz. And I learned just how you could update that outdated 1960s galley kitchen. A highlight of the teen magazines was the horoscope at the end, which would tell us exactly how the whole month was gonna go down whether we would find love or get a better paying babysitting job or ace that exam. Since Southern Living certainly did not have a horoscope section, I had a different scheme. I ascertained what my love, financial, and friendship fortunes that month would be based on the new house floor plan 
featured in the magazine. That's right. If I liked the pantry or master bedroom placement, or if there was a lovely detail to the oh-so-popular wet bar, I just knew it was going to be a great month. If there was a less than desirable feature, say a bad location for the downstairs half bath, all bets were off. I could be in for a rough month. Obviously, I did not grow up to be an architect because that would have required me to, in fact, understand the mathematical principles that hold buildings upright. And I did not become a designer either, although I would love to talk to you about paint color. And I no longer believe that my month will be made or broken by the house plan in Southern Living. They don't even really run that feature the same way they used to. But I still do look for signs, signs that might reveal to me what is next, where the good news is coming from, what I can trust to point me in the right direction, tangible facts, figures, roadmaps, whatever it is to assure me that things are headed in the right direction and that I am dialed into that direction. A sign of hope. I haven't stopped needing that. Today, our gospel reading from John is a familiar passage, one we often hear at funerals. This passage in John's gospel falls right after Jesus has washed the disciples' feet and fed them the Last Supper, and Judas has run off into the night to go and blow the whole thing up. Jesus knew the way the night would end. He knew the way the next few days would end. He knew how all of this would end and then begin again as something new. But the disciples did not know. And Jesus seems attuned to this and he offers them words of hope, words affirming their belovedness and worth, grounding them in the way of love he has been showing them. Do not let yourselves be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my father's house, there are many dwelling places. In the King James Version that I heard as a child, instead of house and dwelling places, it reads many mansions and rooms. And believe you me, that that house plan loving little girl sure perked up at that, just imagining the possibilities. Jesus begins the passage by assuring the disciples that they belong, that there is a place for them. He says he's going ahead of them and that he will also come back for them so that they can be together forever. Then Jesus tells them that in fact, they already know how to get there. Thomas, Thomas pipes up. Blessed doubting Thomas, who in a few short passages will need to touch the wounds of the resurrected Jesus to believe he is real. He points out that in fact, no, he has no idea where Jesus is going, and that most certainly means he does not know how to get there. I adore Thomas and his honesty, and I'd like to think that Jesus did too, and that the words that were spoken next to Thomas were spoken with such comfort and love, words that uphold Thomas. Jesus says, Thomas, I am the way and the truth and the life. I hear Jesus saying, Thomas, you do know the way. I've been showing it to you through my words, through my actions, in the company I keep, and all the ways that I've opened up the truth of God's love to you by being in this world, by being love in this world. This love I have shown you is the way. This love is what is most true about God. This love is the way to live. The next few sentences of scripture that follow have been used in ways that have served to exclude and hurt others for ages. But honestly, when I really settle into the scene of this passage, into the posture and the place Jesus is with his disciples this night. What I hear are words that invite us all into the fullness of God's love, the way, the truth, the life. 
Jesus says, no one comes to the Father except through me. If you know me, you know my Father. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. I hear Jesus saying, see Thomas, the road I have been steering you on is the way of God's love. You spend all this time loving me and following me. And in doing that, you have been loving and following God. You do know God. You do know love. And you have seen God. You've seen what love looks like in me. Then it's Philip's turn to pipe up. Lord, show us the Father and we will be satisfied. I sincerely wonder if some of the other disciples didn't try to shush him or cringe when he blurted that out. Demanding proof. So Jesus patiently goes on. Philip, how is it that I have been with you all this time and you still don't know me? I imagine more dialogue here. Jesus saying, Philip, you still don't get it. Have you not seen me pour out so much love into this world? Watch me feed multitudes? Been there when I've eaten with people that everyone else has given up on and embraced the ones who have been rejected out of fear? Have you not witnessed what has been broken, being made whole through love? Thomas and Philip ask real questions that show both the beauty and the limitations of being a human. Jesus was offering them hope this night, but it was so hard for them to hear. They needed a roadmap, a sign, something concrete. But this is just now not how it works with God. This passage is for people who still have questions like Thomas and Philip. Questions that linger and sit with us long after the resurrection and ascension. We need so much more than maps or signs or horoscopes in the back of a magazine. We need hope in God's love. Brene Brown, noted researcher and author, has said this of hope. Hope is not an emotion. Hope is a cognitive behavioral process that we learn when we experience adversity, when we have relationships that are trustworthy, when people have faith in our ability to get out of a jam. Jesus and his life with the disciples had shown them how to get through incredible adversity. He lifted people up out of interminable situations, restoring them to life right in front of the disciples. Jesus showed himself to be the one that they could trust, trust to calm the storms, trust to pull them into the boat, trust to fill their nets. And as he washed their feet and fed them before he spoke these words to them this night, he showed them that he without doubt believed that they had every ability to get out of a jam and that he knew that they had the ability to help others do the very same thing. But hope can be hard to come by. Even for those who are filled up and surrounded by love, it can be hard to have hope. When we are in the middle of a jam, relying on hope can even seem trivial. I need measurables, the action plan, the number in the bank account, the acceptance letter, the line on the graph to start trending down. I'm not even above looking for a sign like the perfect house plan in Southern Living. Many times I want to be like Thomas and blurt out, how am I even supposed to follow you, Jesus, if I don't know where I'm going and I have far less control over this situation than I think I need? And I can get pretty deep in the weeds and like Philip, go so far as to demand some kind of proof. Today, we are in the midst of a far more complex and troubling situation than anything that could be called a jam. 
and it can be very hard to find hope right now, much less a roadmap or a plan to get us through. But hope in God is not just optimism or positive thinking. Hope in God is the way and the truth in the life. We know the one who sees us through, the one in whom we can trust, and the one who has faith in us. We know the one who has shown us the way of love, the truth of what love can do, and the beauty of what a life lived in this love looks like. I speak to you in the name of the Good Shepherd who leads us into life. Please join me for the prayers of the people. The response is, for the sake of your name, lead us and guide us. In this holy season of the resurrection of Jesus, who will never leave us alone or comfortless, give us the eyes of faith that we may behold him in all his redeeming work. And with our hearts say, for the sake of your name, lead us and guide us. We hold before God for those for whom life is very difficult right now. We hold before God all those who are sick or suffering, especially during this worldwide outbreak of illness, that each may know the comfort of your loving, healing spirit. For the sake of your name, lead us and guide us. We hold before God all doctors and nurses, nursing assistants and all caregivers, all public health officials, and those whose wisdom is needed to guide us towards renewed health and life. For the sake of your name, lead us and guide us. We hold before God all those who may be especially vulnerable and who may be lost or forgotten that the spirit of the Good Shepherd may be alive among your people and bring them home. For the sake of your name, lead us and guide us. We hold before God all those who hold the public trust as our elected representatives and leaders, that you would endue them with your wisdom and love for the benefit of the whole human family and for your glory. For the sake of your name, lead us and guide us. We hold before God this parish family and the mission of your church throughout the world, that you would knit us together in the powerful bonds of your love that draw your kingdom near. For the sake of your name, lead us and guide us. 
We hold before God those who are disappointed in something which they had hoped for very much. And for those who are sad because someone they loved has died, especially remembering Joy Massey and George Moncure. For the sake of your name, lead us and guide us. We hold before our loving God, our shepherd who supplies our every need, our grateful hearts and thanksgiving for the unexpected joys of this life, for the gifts of human kindness we see every day, and for new life. For the sake of your name, lead us and guide us. O oh God, who raised your blessed Son from the tomb of death and has made the whole creation new, grant that we may hear his voice and lead us, even now, from death to life, for his tender mercy's sake. Amen. These and all our prayers we offer as we pray together the prayer Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever, amen. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you, forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. The peace of the Lord be always with you, and also with you. Life is short, and we have too little time to gladden the hearts of those who travel the way with us. So, be swift to love, and make haste to be kind, and the blessing of God Almighty the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, bless, preserve, and keep you this day and forevermore. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Alleluia, alleluia. Thanks be to God. Alleluia, alleluia.